I've been privileged in my life to always be the fly on the wall in very interesting situations. To be a worker bee around people who I greatly respected and admired and wanted to help and enable in any way I could. So the people in Congress I worked for, the people in the DC City Council I worked for, the people in social justice movements that I worked for, like George Wiley on national welfare rights and Ralph Nader on consumer, uh, consumer rights. Um, I was never a leader. I was never a policymaker, but I was there and I got to be part of it and I got to learn it and I got to help uh, with whatever skills I had. So I, I feel very lucky in the life that I've led. Charlene Krantz, you're a native Washingtonian. What were you doing between 1960 and 1975 in Washington, D.C.? Um, in 1960, I was 14 years old. I was in middle school. Uh, I had come out of a labor family. My father worked for unions my whole growing up. So my early experiences included picket lines and strike meetings and Union Christmas party, which my dad, the Jew, was always Santa Claus. Um, when we moved uh, to Maryland in 61, my father walked on the Glen Echo picket line, and I remember being in someone's basement assembling the picket signs for Glen Echo. So I had a long experience um, at home of uh, being an activist and working for social justice. As I got into high school, um, it was the same time that the black college students in the South were starting to organize and the, I remember reading in the paper about the sit-ins and about the Freedom Rides and um, eventually by the time I was in 11th grade I found the SNCC group at Howard University uh, which was called the Nonviolent Action Group. So as an 11th and 12th grader uh, I got a driving license and I went to the SNCC meetings at Howard University and the, the college students were very welcoming in my memory um, and included me in activities and took me door-to-door -door canvassing and took me on uh, demonstrations down Route 40 between Washington and Baltimore. Um, I went to my first SNCC conference was Thanksgiving of 63. It was the uh, actually the week uh, after the Kennedy assassination on the cover of the program was a picture of President Kennedy. So I, I met SNCC people from all across the South at that conference. Um, in my senior year in high school, I organized a Montgomery County organization called Students Against Discrimination, which was for all Montgomery County high school students to do support work for the civil rights movement in the South. And uh, in uh, spring break of 64, I went South. I went to Atlanta for a conference at Gannon Seminary, SNCC conference. And then um, I was very active with the NAG group um, the, uh, my whole senior year. And uh, then it was 1964. I graduated from high school that June. Let's talk specifically about the summer of 1964. What were you doing all that summer? I worked in the Washington, D.C. office of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the MFDP. Um, the MFDP was organizing itself to challenge the white Democratic Mississippi delegation to the Democratic Convention, which was to be held in Atlantic City in August of 64. So the Washington MFDP office was involved in fundraising, was involved in lobbying Democratic members of Congress who would be with their state legislation, state delegations, sorry, at the convention. Um, we brought uh, the key members of the Mississippi Freedom Democrats from Mississippi to Washington for briefing and to help them write their statement. Um, at one point, uh, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, who was the vice chair 
of the MFDP came to Washington to uh, write the testimony that she would give to the Credentials Committee in Atlantic City. That summer, uh, my parents went away for the summer, and my brother went away to sleepaway camp. So I was left with the house and the car and my mother's credit card to Woodward & Lothrop, a now defunct department store. Um, so when Fannie Lou Hamer came to Washington, she, uh, she stayed at my house. And I drove, drove her to the office in the morning, and we came home every evening to you know, have dinner and go to bed. And um, at some point, I said to her, what are you going to wear to the convention? And she said, well, I only have these few things that I brought. I don't have any really nice clothes. I said, well, let me take you shopping. So I, with my mother's credit card, I took Fannie Lou Hamer to Woody's. And we bought a week's worth of outfits. We bought her dresses and purses and undergarments and shoes and accessories, um, everything but the white gloves. She didn't want gloves. Um, and I have to say, when my, when my parents did get home from, from the summer and there was this large expenditure on my mother's credit card, her only comment to me was, did she get something nice? So that's an example of the kind of support I had at home. I never had to um, fight against my home life to, to be a social activist. So uh, that was the summer, of course, when um, Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney uh, went missing early in, in June. And Rita Schwerner, Mickey Schwerner's wife, came to Washington to talk to the people at the uh, Justice Department at some point about the search, the Justice Department's search for the three missing civil rights workers. And again, I had the house and the car, and so Rita Schwerner stayed with me that week that she was in Washington talking to the government. And she got a phone call in, in my living room from the uh, Attorney General. And I only heard Rita's side of the conversation. But she got very quiet, and after a while she said, when? And then there was a pause. Sorry. <laughs> and then she said, where? There was a pause, and she said, I'm on my way. And the call was to tell her that they had found the bodies of the three workers. So she packed up, and I drove her to the airport, and she went to Mississippi to identify her husband. So that was part of that summer. So, the, so we're getting up to uh, the end of August, which is when the Democratic Convention was. And uh, Joe Rao was the counsel. For the, for the Mississippi Freedom Democrats. And he gave the assignment to write the brief to the Credentials Committee stating the case for the seating of the MFDP to a second year Yale law student named Eleanor Holmes. So Eleanor came to work in our office to write the brief. And I being the main typist in the office, Eleanor and I were given a private room and she wrote the brief in longhand on a legal pad and hand it to me page by page to type. And those of you who are a lot younger than I who are listening to this, we typed it on a typewriter with carbon paper to make a second copy. And if there was a mistake, you had to erase it with a little eraser. That's how it was done in those days. And if you needed to rewrite it and write a second draft, you had to retype the entire thing. So Eleanor and I uh, worked together to write to write the brief, which was given to the Credentials Committee. Um, and then at uh, the fourth week in August, we packed up the office and moved it to Atlantic City, where the headquarters hotel was the GEM Hotel, G-E-M. And all the delegates stayed in the GEM, and the, all the communications material were in the GEM. And all the lobbying was assigned from the GEM. And I was put in the, uh, the room with the shortwave radios to dispatch all the, the cars that were driving the delegates around Atlantic City so that they could lobby different state delegations and then go to the convention center to be seated. So I, that was my job that week. Well, after 1964, that eventful year, 
what other issues did you work on as a young activist after that summer? Also, civil rights issues continuing, I'm assuming, but right. uh, what did you do after so that? So over the year and a half after that, I, I continued to work for SNCC, both in the, the New York SNCC office, and then I came back to the Washington SNCC office, and the new director of the Washington SNCC office was a young man from Mississippi named Marion Barry, and so I, I worked for him in the SNCC office, and he took on issues that had a, a more local nature. Um, DC home rule, uh, the bus, the DC buses, we had a big bus boycott over um, bus fare, um, and housing and jobs, and uh, so we worked on, on that kind of thing. And then um, there came a time in early in 1966 when SNCC, as a policy, decided that the white people in SNCC should go work in the white community. And that sounded perfectly logical to me. And so a group of us in Washington set out to do that. Um, how did you get into your fair housing work, uh, access? Uh, was right. that as a result of your civil yes, rights so work? Yes, so the, uh, the people who had been around SNCC, um, the white people, we coalesced and decided that one of the key issues in Washington was um, housing or the lack of it for in, in a lot of the metropolitan area for uh, black people who were looking to rent or to buy. There was what was called redlining, which were areas of the city where blacks were not allowed to buy. Um, there were restrictive covenants in housing deeds, which said you're not allowed to sell this house to a Jew or a Negro. Um, and that was all perfectly legal at that time. So ACCESS, which stands for the Action Coordinating Committee to End Segregation in the Suburbs. Um, and we used the Beltway as, a, as an icon, saying that the Beltway was like a noose around the city, and that uh, blacks could live in the city, but they couldn't move out into the suburbs, out by the Beltway or beyond the Beltway. Um, so we had a lot of uh, direct action. The, the ACCESS people were both black and white um, adults, from the Washington metropolitan area. And we hired um, a man who I had known from SNCC, who was then a Howard University Law School student, a guy named Charlie Jones. So he became the executive director of ACCESS. And he came with all the energy and ideas about how you could trans translate the goal of fair housing into direct action. That was Charlie's genius. Um, and so one of the issues we took on was the fact that a lot of the housing in Northern Virginia around the Northern Virginia military bases was segregated. There were miles and miles and miles of garden apartments all around uh, Fort Myer and the other Northern Virginia military installations which were white only. So the black military, black men mostly then in the military, they couldn't house their families anywhere near where they worked the way the white soldiers could. And to make matters worse, of course, the military was giving the soldiers housing allowances. And the housing allowances were paid directly from the military to the landlord. So in effect, the federal government was paying these white landlords to stay segregated because it underwrote the segregated housing policies. So we took that on as an issue. And Charlie and, and the members of ACCESS spent many, 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 many hours um, negotiating in the Pentagon at a very high level to get the, the military to roll back this policy of giving money to segregated housing. And, and this was all through the, the year 1966. And in the end, it was successful. The um, LBJ and the, the Pentagon powers that be, they did cancel that policy. And they put out an edict that said, not only in Washington, but worldwide, the Pentagon would no longer give, the military would no longer give housing subsidies to segregated housing. So that's a huge change in the federal government's policy, which I attribute 100% to Charlie Jones and his creative thinking and his organizing ability. So that, that was a victory that ACCESS could claim. And that came two years before the Federal Fair Housing Act, which was passed in 68. The Pentagon made that change in its policy in 66. So um, among the other places that ACCESS um, demonstrated was a, a large variety of 
garden apartments and middle income apartments in the Maryland and Virginia suburbs. Um, I have a little show and tell. This is the access picket line at the Queenstown Apartments in Hyattsville, Maryland, and this is the Klan on the next sidewalk picketing us. So this is Hyattsville. This is what's now considered very much part of the D.C. Uh, region. This is November 66. Just got to wrestle. Um, we picketed at the Summit Hills apartments. We picketed at apartments in Mount Rainier. We picketed at um, apartments in uh, Fairfax, the Americana apartments in Fairfax County, Fairlington, which is in Arlington. We were all around the region. And um, happily, access was put out of business by the Fair Housing Act in 68. So it's an example of an organization that worked itself out of a job. No, I know. However, we have, oh, oh, excuse me. Oh, I was going to say, so the activists in access did not just fade off into the twilight. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, we need to keep going on other issues. So there were a group of Jews within access. Um, and we came up with a, a new organization called Jews for Urban Justice. And it was also very active, 68, 69, 70. Um, we were involved in the anti-ICBM um, actions of that time. We had a, a Tubishvat vigil on the steps of the Capitol while inside the Congress was debating ICBMs. Um, we took on those, those kinds of issues, not just local issues. Um, in, the, in 1970, Jews for Urban Justice sort of segued into a group that also had Friday evening Shabbat dinners and Saturday morning study groups. And it became um, a little more uh, cultural and religious, and that segued into a group called Fabrengen, which was culturally um, Jewish related. Um, and I have to say it was through Jews for Urban Justice that I met the man who became my husband, so I have a very warm spot in my heart for for that organization at that period. Now, um, you worked with JUJ. Didn't you also work at, with the Great Boycott at one point, or was that through JUJ? Yes, Jews for Urban Justice worked on the boycott, right. definitely. We raised money. We brought uh, farm workers, grape workers, to Washington so that they could lobby members of Congress. And we housed them and fed them and drove them around. Um, we leafleted in front of Safeways. We were very involved in the Great Boycott. Yes. How did you um, spend the 70s up to 1975, which is our outer limit uh, of time for this project? Right. Uh, that last five years, were you involved in anti-war things in addition to all this other stuff? I was in involved. I worked on the, the mobilization, the big mob, as we said, um, as a staff person for about half a year organizing that one. Um, I worked for two members of Congress during that period, both of whom were very progressive. Who were they? Um, I worked for Bella Abzug for one term, and then I worked for um, Allard Lowenstein for another term. The last question that we have is, what do you think all these events you participated in brought to the rest of your life after those years? Well, it's like they, they say about a baby duck, the first thing it sees is it's, it's marked on that to follow for the rest of its life. Um, my, of course, my childhood and my young adulthood all marked me for the rest of my life um, as someone who um, I've always been interested in social justice. I've always tried to be active as a progressive and given my time and energy and, and whatever talent I had to social justice movements. Um, after the Civil Rights Movement, the anti-war movement, then there was the women's movement, and then there was um, the gay movement, and there were the disability rights peoples, and uh, there was a period there when I was the uh, fair play for Cuba early, early on in the 60s. Um, so it's always been where my heart's been, and it's always uh, give, given my feet a direction, a path. I don't think it's anything you ever walk away from once you've done that as a young activist. 
Thank you, Charlene. Any closing thoughts? No, I just, I'm so happy that you are capturing the memories of those of us who were around in the 60s, mm -hmm. 50 years later, and that we can remember.